get back to that staircase. Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining me tonight, and I'm going to have a tough time this evening. i got three criminal defense attorneys with me. Lara Uretzian is with us. We've also got Eklund Mercy, who's always attacking me, and Josh <laughs> Schiffer, who sometimes doesn't let me get a word in edgewise. Uh, it's great <laughs> to have all three of you here. Um, uh, Good to Lara, be here. what happened on that staircase? And, and please don't tell me it was an owl. You know, I'm not going to go with the owl theory, that's for sure. But, you know, the defense theory made some sense, sense to me, and that should have created a reasonable doubt, at least the way I see it, the way they had um, her falling backwards, and that would explain why there was so much blood, and there was a spot where her head could have hit. And uh, to me, it made some sense, and a jury could have, if they wanted to, could have acquitted him because they had... They could have decided that there was reasonable doubt. And it makes sense. I mean, look yeah, at I'm it. If you fast forward, at this point, you've got him. Later on, he had he ent ended up entering a plea to a manslaughter, which means the prosecution also had some doubts as far as their evidence goes. Well, uh, yeah, they had real problems because they had a, an agent who lied on the stand and was completely discredited, fired, and tried to get his job back, Agent Deaver. That was their big problem. Uh, uh, but Eklund... Um, uh, there's two people home. I mean, this is a guy who's got uh, lots of issues in terms of money, in terms of who he really is sexually, the life he wants to lead, some frustration, some writer's block, right? And, and come on, two people at home, one of them's alive, the other's dead, and all that blood? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as a defense attorney, you're going to try to, you know, shoot your shot. I I can see the argument for, you know, the defense's theory, but I can also see the 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 prosecution's theory. Now, what I cannot see is an owl theory, and that is just me. Um, I think that you can argue either way. I think that's one of those fact questions. It's who who did a better closing type case because it's so close. It can go either way. So I think um, I, 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 I wouldn't be able to call it because there's a lot of blood towards the end of the, the um, there's a lot of blood towards the end of the hallway, but I don't see the blood on the, on the beam at the door. It would have at least had like droplets down if she would have had to hit first to make all of that. Or it could have been like she was smacked over the head that part and then was smacked over the head later on. So there's a lot of things that you can argue. Yeah, Josh, you look at that staircase. Uh, you don't see an owl or an accident, do you? <laughs> it's not my job to see an owl. I don't got to prove anything. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. It's the state's job to prove what happened. They've got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what happened. And it's not the defense's job to prove that alibi, mm -hmm. and it could have been an owl, and it could have been a slip. It could have been Jessica, mm -hmm. the house elf. Who knows? <laughs> Anything could have happened. It's not the job of the defense to show the jury exactly what happened and prove it. That's an undeniable burden of the state. They can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, one, the one problem that prosecutors had during the trial, and, and many thought this was going to be reasonable doubt in the case, was they didn't have a murder weapon, Lara. No murder weapon. They, they were saying throughout the trial it was the blow poke. They never found the blow poke, and then the defense found the blow poke in the middle of the trial. So basically, no murder weapon, no motive. Uh, it sounds like, and a pretty good uh, explanation by the defense. If you ask me, I I'm surprised this man was convicted based on the evidence that I'm hearing, and especially now that we know also you've got the, uh, the bloodstain expert exaggerating things and has had problems in many, many cases. My understanding is over 30 cases where he's had issues and problems were found. Uh, this looks like a pretty strong case for the defense, even though we're past that point in a very interesting Netflix uh, movie, docu docu-series. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, Josh, when, when I think about this case, you know, first impression is a lasting impression. And when I went and I walked into that mansion, I made the left turn, and then they took the boards off of the sealed uh, staircase, and I looked at it, I was like, why are you guys uh, showing this to me? But they, they believed that that evidence there was consistent with their theory, that, that this could have been an accident, it could have been something else. I think they're looking back at it now saying, we don't know exactly what it was, but um, without a murder weapon, 
Uh, you can still prove a murder, though, right? You don't, I don't, need, I don't the need the murder point, weapon, though. do I? They're proving that there's lots of different things that could have happened. And that's really what matters. You, you, the state has to tell a concise story that they sell to the jury. They used an expert witness that was later found to be completely uh, manipulating. And Josh, and, let me ask you something, though, Josh. Let me ask you, Josh. So let's let's say you're in Vegas, right? And and you you can bet on owl, you can bet on accident, or you can bet on bludgeoning murder. Which one are you betting on? Uh, there's so many choices. No one can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the problem. All right. And the state case is well, matter, folks, right? Have it, noted. It's not a great. Here's state's the great case. news. Here's the great news. Everyone can make no. up their own minds at home. You don't have to listen to me or anyone else. The entire trial now available on demand. You can watch it for the first time since 2003. It's all for free. You can binge it. It'll take a while. It's like the longest trial in North Carolina history. But maybe by the time you finish it, you'll be allowed to leave your house. All right. When we come back, speaking of COVID, um, how about the impact that COVID is having on our privacy rights? That debate next. And we have drones that are uh, identifying people using facial recognition programs. Police in some countries are then showing up at their homes because they have uh, been violating the quarantine. We have drones that can take the temperature of people. All right, so in the midst of, of this pandemic and the restrictions that people have and, and what the government is doing, there's a real question, a real battle taking place between individual liberty and, and privacy rights and what the government is doing uh, in, the, in the name of public safety. Julie Grant took a closer look. This is the Volusia Sheriff's Office. Please adhere to social distancing guidelines. Drones in the sky keeping an eye are just one of the ways we're being watched. But before we sound the surveillance alarm, giving up our privacy rights Dropping. happened long before COVID-19. We asked legal expert and Duquesne University law professor Joseph Sabino Mystic for his take on the privacy debate. Americans have rarely hesitated when asked to trade their constitutional rights for added security, added safety. Uh, we see that with public housing applicants who want to get a unit in a public housing community, and they may have to relinquish their protections against unreasonable search and seizure, the Fourth Amendment rights. The entire country experiencing privacy changes after 9-11. We began to see warrantless searches and warrantless uh, wiretaps. Uh, we've seen secret courts and uh, secret trials take place. So those represented major shifts in our degree of rights, in our, our rights to privacy. COVID-19 is occurring when surveillance capabilities are at an all-time high and already all around us. Our every move can be tracked by our cell phones and our cars. Uh, Big Brother is here. But we've invited Big Brother to come here, and now we have to deal with the negative aspects of that over time. State officials in New Mexico are examining cell phone data to gauge social distancing. They're just using aggregate data. We don't have any idea who any of the, the cell phone numbers belong to, not just in New Mexico, but nowhere in the country. Governors have broad powers in times of emergency. That's why it, this power resides with the executive, because the executive is the one branch of government that can make the swift decision, and that's what's most important in times like this. It's clear that our aggressive strategy to slow the spread has been working and is saving countless lives. Our leaders must balance the interests of society with our individual freedoms. I hope we're going to have a vaccine, and, and we're going to fast track it like you've never seen before. Then we'll be facing another privacy issue, whether a COVID-19 vaccine should be required. Now, in Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905, the United States Supreme Court ruled that even mandatory inoculations, mandatory vaccination programs were 
legitimate in the interest of the safety of the community. The court saying individual liberties are not absolute and comparing the government action to self-defense. Just as individuals can defend themselves, the community can defend itself as well. And sometimes that takes precedence over the interests of an individual. To put it simply, Professor Mystic says, remember the famous principle from Cicero, that the safety of the people is the supreme law. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more concerned about the Constitution and eroding rights and eroding liberties uh, because it's the, the, the government that's jumping in uh, to take a look at all this. And uh, where are we right now? And, and what is going to happen? Let's bring back in our think tank, Eklund Mercy, are you concerned at all about eroding rights, eroding liberties, you know, tracking our cell phone usage? And do we trust uh, that whoever's tracking it will be a human being is using it for the right purpose? I mean, where's the, the line? There's, there's so much wrong with this. There is no line because not one person in that whole thing told me what they're going to do with the data. As of right now, they know exactly where people are. They're at beaches. They're, uh, they're in front of varsity. They're in places in crowds. So what you're telling me is like, what, what are you going to do with that data? We already know where they are. We already know that they're outside. What it seems like is that, and then are you going to apply it culturally? Because, you know, we see in the areas with mostly white people, they are, you know, the officers are giving them face masks and telling them to move accordingly. And then people on um, places where heavily black areas are, we have, you know, police brutality. So it's not even... We haven't even gotten to that part yet. And then you're talking about mandatory inoculation when we don't even have a mandatory stay at home. So I need you to be consistent. Was my safety uh, was my safety a concern before or is my safety a concern after the vaccine? Because it's not consistent. Therefore, my constitutional rights should not be violated. You have absolutely had every right since since you found out to help me to pr protect the people. You had it and you did not do it. And now we have the stay at home order that's being reduced right now. And then now you're going to tell me that, hey, this vaccine comes in. I need you to definitely take it. It's not consistent. It's not consistent. Let's take a listen because the professor uh, talked to uh, Julie uh, about those mandated vaccines. Let's take a listen. Mandatory uh, vaccinations for school children are pretty much standard. However, each state approaches it in their own way. So in some states, we have exemptions for religious purposes. Uh, some states, no exemptions for any purpose. And in some states, there are exemptions for even personal belief reasons. Josh Schiffer, is it possible that they could mandate 320 yeah. million Americans to take a vaccine? Absolutely. But really, the core issue is the government doesn't have to mandate that. What's taken away our privacy is capitalism and profits. We have exactly. sold our information at rock bottom rates to every single electronic device we have. That marketplace is going to force people to, to vaccinate and to carry health papers. It's going to be if you want to participate in a market activity, you're going to have to prove you're safe. It's going to be the boardrooms that force this. But yeah, the government can absolutely force people to get a vaccine. Uh, there will be exceptions, and I'm sure there'll be some fights. But really, it's not a hill to die on. Lara, are you at all concerned about the eroding uh, rights and liberties that Americans are seemingly giving up, and a lot of them giving up very willingly? I'm always worried. I'm always concerned about the erosion of our rights, especially privacy rights. And interestingly, Americans, all of us uh, included, uh, when it's a time when we're scared, whether it be a 9-11 or a pandemic, we're always more willing. It's the perfect time for the government to exploit our fears and basically start slowly uh, taking away more and more of our privacy rights. And we it's in those circumstances that we see erosion of rights. And it's scary, I have to tell you. Yes, over the years, maybe we have given up a lot of these rights to see that more and more of that is going to go away. My goodness, I start wondering, are we going to be living in a brave new world where, where the government knows everything we're doing? And I agree. I have no idea. None of us know what's going to happen with this information. Now they say we're going to use it 
uh, to protect the community and it's for the health and safety of everyone. Uh, we're protecting the elderly, anyone who has oh. got who's, whose health is compromised. But but what what are you really truly doing? But, How do I know what you're going to do with this later? How long is this going to go on for? By the way, when does it stop? Why, why are we waiting for the vaccine? People are dying now. People are dying now, and they're reopening states. So when is life important? Before a vaccine or after? We literally have the tools right now to stop it right now. To, to but why are we even focusing on the vaccine, by the way? It's not just about yeah. vaccines. There's also cures. They can come up with a cure. I'm hoping but, that scientists out that there are working it, on cures, too, and we're not forced to be, take the vaccine. It won't be we're, necessary if they would just keep people in. If you want to protect my life, protect it at all times. Don't pick and choose what time you're going to protect my life. Don't pick and choose what time you're going to protect my children's life. You protect it 100% because that is what you signed up for. You don't say it's okay for old people to die and it's okay for younger, you know, it's okay for younger people to suffer. And then at the end of the day say, oh, for equal rights purposes, for the protection of the whole, we're going to have to inoculate you. It makes no sense. Let me, let me ask you something. Let me, let me jump in here and, and throw this out. How does the Constitution play in all of this? Because where the government decides everything, I've seen that. It, you know, it's called China. It's called Cuba. It's called the old Soviet Union. Uh, but they don't have the Constitution. We do. So how does the Constitution play into what the government is attempting to do and in telling us where we can go and when we can go there? Yeah, where's my freedom? Where's my freedom to decide what I'm going to do and how to take care of my family? And balancing that against the common need of the whole population to have vaccination, there's a balance there. You can't shut down the universe. You can't. But No, but here's the thing. I have a right to kill somebody who goes into my house un un unintentionally. I have the right to kill them. I have the right to protect my home. So, But you can come into my body. That makes no sense. The freedom has to be consistent. So you can't say, I have a right to shoot somebody who's trying to um, come into my house, but please feel free to put whatever you want to put into my veins. When we, also, when we equally have the uh, opportunity to shut this down, we've had plans uh, th in place to un shut it down. Uh, absolutely unconnected. The vaccination has nothing the, to do with the here, shutdown. It doesn't matter. Is My, a personal it, sovereignty no, the, the, issue. the fact that they're the issue is, is that the argument is so prevalent because with the numbers are so high, so they can really push this vaccination. You're working off of fear. So you're working off of fear now because oh. you garnered all the fear. People are dying in droves. People are in don't, trucks. In people are in refrigerated bodies are in refrigerated trucks right now. Bodies are refrigerated I wish trucks. That the people can't have funerals. People can't have funerals because they did not shut states down. They are opening You're states. Right. They are opening beaches. So my issue is, when was my life important? Is it important now or is it important after the vaccine? Be consistent. It's important I'm, the entire time. But my so no, it, it does, no, it isn't because you're reopening. Here's the thing: the little, the economic hardship, the economic hardship should never, should never outweigh a person's life. It should never, never. That's not the type of country that we live in. It should never outweigh somebody's life. So the fact that we're well, doing it has, this balancing though. life, it, it has, no, but it should all never. of humanity. So I appreciate the sentiment, but it's not a sentiment. There was, a, whole, not there was a playbook. There was a playbook bought by We shall Obama continue this playbook. debate. We had we had we had I a promise you we, we we had a whole shall bunch of people continue this debate in future programs but for now we got to take a short break when we come back folks a lot more to talk about including zombies Welcome back to Court TV Live I'm crime and justice reporter Julia Janae this is your Court TV news break First up tonight, the story of a woman in South Carolina who was arrested for some stomach-turning behavior. Shanir Gibson Holiday was taken into custody over the weekend after reports she allegedly licked her hands, was coughing and touching food items in the store. Officers looked at the surveillance video of the suspect doing the same thing with freezer door handles 
and several surfaces at a sandwich shop. The manager of that sandwich shop also reported the woman licking coins, putting them back in the tip jar, as well as licking her own hands before handing over money to the clerk. Holiday was put on a trespass notice for all of these locations. She's being charged with aggravated breach of peace and food tampering and issued a violation citation for the stay at home or work order in the state. She's being held at a detention center on a $100,000 bond and was ordered to be tested for the coronavirus. And a Florida man was arrested for living out his quarantine at the happiest place on earth. Richard McGuire here is charged with trespassing for allegedly camping on a Disney Island, a part of the Walt Disney World in Florida. The arrest report says security spotted Richard McGuire briefly and then searched the property to find him and take him into custody. He claims he didn't know the area was off limits and that the resort is, quote, a tropical paradise. Officers say the signs clearly marked the area and restricted it with no trespassing signs. All Disney parks have been shut down due to the coronavirus outbreak. The clerk's office says McGuire is due in court next month. That's it for your Court TV news break. Live from the newsroom, back to you, Vinny. Wow. What was he eating, those, those huge turkey legs? I, I mean, mean, it is the happiest place on earth, and if you've got to get away from everyone, go to an empty theme park. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. All right, folks, let's talk about Doomsday Cult, Mom. We know two kids missing. We know uh, a dead uh, ex-husband, uh, the wife of, his, um, new, of her new husband, and her brother, all dead. So... Why are all these people dead, and, and what could the connection be? Well, earlier tonight, I spoke with Ashley Banfield about it, and it could be their belief in zombies. We're starting to see a lot of connections, Vinny, between all the people who are dead and missing in Lori Vallow's orbit and the fact that she and Chad thought that they'd been possessed by zombies, according to those who are starting to show up in documents, show up in interviews, etc. This whole group of five, Vinny, Tammy, Charles, Brandon, Kylie, JJ, at some point, Chad and or Lori said to someone or indicated in some way that each of these people had been become possessed by zombies. And what, why does that matter? I mean, other than it just sounds silly. To them, it isn't silly. To them and their cult-like religion, if your soul has been taken, if your body has been taken over by a zombie, your soul sort of sits out here in the uh, in the ether and is in limbo, can't go anywhere, and can only be, you know, ascending into heaven if that body is killed. Let me just give you something that we were able to, um, I can source this to, to NBC News and, and Dateline, because they were able to get their hands on some text messages that Charles sent to a friend not long before he also died. He said this. Something snapped. It's so unbelievable and scary. I am thankful she, meaning Lori, doesn't see JJ, meaning their son. She wants him and for me to disappear. Seriously, it's the freakiest thing I've ever experienced. She's with a group of people called Woke and Preparing a People. She actually believes I'm not Charles. Here's where it gets weird. She says an evil spirit named Nick Schneider murdered me and is using me to violate her. And if those text messages that Charles sent to his friend, according to Dateline, aren't enough, well, then let's just take it right from Charles's lawyer, because in his divorce filings and custody efforts against Lori Vallow, his lawyer wrote, if Charles got in the way of Lori's mission, she would murder him. What's interesting, the pattern I've seen here is that it's all these spouses of people who got remarried very quickly after splitting yes. up with their spouses and they just happened to be demons. Just just noting for the record. They just, they just happened to be, or uh, they, they might be in a custody battle. That's the other thing. Yeah, but the, 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 the rapidity at which they got married is actually really scary because Alex got married um, in Vegas and, and Melanie got married in Vegas, I think a day or a week apart, I lost track. And then Lori got remarried. Uh, Chad was 17 days having put his wife in the ground, not even since she died 17 days later. So yes, there, there was a very strange, um, speed and, and Melanie actually addressed that on, on Dateline. She said, well, we, you know, that's our religion. We just do things 
podcast. <laughs> like that's going to sit with a jury wow. if it ever gets there. I know. Crazy. All right. So let me take you to the children now. Uh, Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallow. Those are the two children of Lori's, right? They're so cute. Um, and this is just so hard because, you know, here we are talking about all these people who died, but these kids we hope are still alive. But the problem is that same document that Melanie's husband wrote that we weren't supposed to see, and yet Dateline got their hands on it, and a couple of other people got their hands on it, and the police apparently have their hands on it, according to NBC. In that, Ian says, my wife Melanie, and I'll just say Melanie, had been told by Chad and Lori that their children had been possessed and had become zombies. And Ian further writes, according to Dateline, that she, Melanie, shared concerns that may indicate Tylee and JJ needed to die. That's the hardest thing to, to read, honestly, Vinny, in those documents. Yeah, and that's the, the one fact in this case, you, you put those together, uh, that mm -hmm. makes you lose hope for JJ and yeah. Tylee. All right, so here, let me bring back in the think tank because the question I have for you, I have three great criminal defense attorneys with me, Lara Uretzian, Josh Schiffer, Eklund Mercy. Um, let's just say, hypothetically, your client is Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell, and you're asking them about the kids, and they tell you they were zombies. They were zombies. That's what your client is telling you. The kids were zombies. Josh, what do you do? Competency is obviously the first thing, but remember, look at this jurisdiction. They, they have some tough competency issues here. You're dealing with someone who is obviously, or quite possibly, very much believes this stuff's true. People wonder how the criminally insane or people justify themselves doing these horrific things like killing kids. It's just like your buddy who sells essential oils or colloidal silver or some other patent snake medicine. It's just taking it to one level further. You've got some religious wacko nut job that you know, and you politely nod your head, but that's because they're not calling people zombies and killing them. It's not a far jump to horrific, awful violence. But I don't, my understanding well, Lara, is let I don't me ask know. You. Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Well, insanity is not even a defense in Idaho, so that's going to be a problem. The competency may end up being a problem. And let me tell you, Vinny, if any case could be a great docuseries for Netflix, this is it. I mean, <laughs> have you ever seen anything stranger than this? You've got um, spouses disappearing, people dying all around, and they're all interconnected. And this zombie thing it is just scary. As I hear about it and how these people believe in uh, their children or husbands and spouses being possessed by demons and their souls being stuck somewhere outside of their bodies. And the only way to save them is by uh, some serious incident or uh, something close to death or killing them. I mean, you start wondering and you start feeling it in your gut. It's this visceral feeling that nothing good is, is going to come out of this. These kids, <clears throat> I would be surprised if these kids are alive. Yeah, uh, I would. it's the whole thing is sad. I mean, we're dealing with people who who are insane. You know, uh, I, in a way, I think th thankfully there's the insanity is not a defense there because these people are horrible people. I would uh, I would definitely not have a competency evaluation, but I actually have like a full fledged um, psychological evaluation just to see where they started at. You, what you do is with the psychological evaluation, they're going to get diagnosed with something. Um, no, I don't believe that a normal functioning human being believes that you know their children has zombies coming out of them. So what you do is you use that information. You know, although it, it's in the state that you know the the competency level, you know that. That's not going to work. But you actually use it for the purposes of sentencing. You can use it for the purposes of plea negotiations. Say, hey, you know, my client has a litany of psychological disorders. She's seeing things. She's hearing things. There are auto, the audio hallucinations, visual hallucinations that have been documented not only by her ex-husband, you know, by different members of the family. So we knew that there was crazy, you know, afoot. So I think that that's what I would do. Definitely do 
do a full-blown psychological evaluation and a full-blown psychological would actually reveal if the children are indeed, well, should reveal if the children are indeed alive. Like, do we have some type of, you know, regret or do we have some, is she hiding something? I mean, are they talking to her inner child? We have no idea, but I think a psychological evaluation would do that. All right, when we come back, folks, uh, a young couple goes missing in North Carolina. What could have happened? The 13th juror speaks next. Good afternoon. On April 19, 2020, Wilmington police were called to a report of two missing women at 376 South Kerr Avenue. The reporting party was a roommate of the missing women. The reporting party stated that the two women had gone missing on the night of April 15, 2020 and the reporting party was under the misconception that you couldn't report a missing person until 72 hours had elapsed. A missing person report was filed and both women were entered into the National Crime Information Center database. Officers on scene began the preliminary investigation and detectives were notified. It is not unusual for persons of this age group to be spontaneous. It was unusual that the roommates didn't come back home and also that they had left all their property in the home. Inside the victim's apartment was unremarkable there were no signs of foul play, and much of their property was still in the apartment. Stephanie Mayorga, Paige Escalara, uh, a young newly engaged couple, um, seemingly went out for, you know, they left the house. There's some, there's some uh, video shots of them leaving the house. Uh, there's a shot of the car that they left in, and everything seemed normal in the video. There was nothing at the apartment, nothing unusual there. Uh, but again, the search has continued. So I posted this uh, on Facebook for two reasons. One, to get the word out and to get their images out there, but also see if anyone had any thoughts about this. 13th juror spoke today. Uh, Lori with our comment of the day, which we begin with. And uh, Lori writes, unfortunately, I think they have met with foul play. I think they would have contacted someone by now. Too many things left behind that normally someone would take with them if they were planning to be gone for an extended period of time. It's a shame the roommate waited so long to report them missing. Cops are days behind because of it. What else does that roommate know that she's not saying? And let me begin with you, Josh, because uh, this is a, a case where they left things behind. There was, there was no evidence of anything foul play uh, where they were living. I think the dog was there, a cell phone left behind. Um, kind of unusual and, and, and tells me that they weren't packing up to go on some adventure. Speculation is a guarantee of an exposure of your confirmation bias. Wherever your brain jumps to first, <laughs> whether it's foul play, whether it's a romantic <laughs> elopement, whatever it is, no. this is uh, speculative mining at its very best. Uh, and I don't know. Is it suspicious? Sure. Could it be spontaneous, youthful love? And I've seen wilder stuff. I heard about a family that's killing its kids because they're zombies. Uh, I, I don't know. And I worry that we take a look at this and, and we're not interested in justice um, because it might be a, a sweet couple. At the same time, I could be dead wrong and they could be in a ditch somewhere and I would feel terrible. Kylie writes tonight, <laughs> it seems as if they were simply running out for a quick errand or perhaps a quick drive down the road. I've done that before, leaving my cell phone at home. I would suspect foul play and start by examining their relationships, thoughts and prayers for their safe return. Um, we're short on time tonight, so we're going to leave it right there with Kylie's uh, last statement. But I want to really thank uh, Larry Uretzian, Josh Schiffer, and Eklund Mercy. Always appreciate your input, your expertise, and please stay safe out there.